Bible's here this morning, let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8 is where we'll be taking our text from this morning. Nehemiah chapter 8 is where we'll be taking our text from. We continue our sermon series through the book of Nehemiah. Last Sunday we began looking here at chapter 8 that there's three ingredients for revival as we see these people, the Israelites, experience a spiritual awakening as a revival takes place. As we said the last week, the chapters 1 through 6, the walls were rebuilt in Jerusalem and now primarily the rest of the book is focusing on rebuilding the people themselves. And so we find here that uh, as we take a closer look at this revival, this awakening, this stirring that takes place among the people there in Israel, we see these three key ingredients. And we saw last Sunday morning that the first, or not the first, one of the key ingredients to having a revival is the preaching of God's Word. There must be the preaching, the heralding, the proclaiming of God's Word if there's going to be a stirring and awakening of revival uh, among the people. This morning we're going to look at the another ingredient, which is hearing the Word of God. The Word must be preached, but it doesn't do a lot of good to preach the Word if someone's not hearing the Word. It must be heard as well. Now, God's people have been commanded to gather as believers to worship and to hear the Word of God being preached and taught. So let's read here in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Then we're going to have prayer together. Notice what the Bible says beginning there in verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake, they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding, those old enough to understand what was being read and preached upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning, daylight. From daylight until midday, roughly six hours. It's a long-winded preacher. <laughs> Before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, and then you had Shema there, and Unaya, and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Manasena. Padiah, Mishuel, Malchiah, Hashem, Hashbedana, Zechariah, and Melashuram there. So I'm going to get those names out of the way, all right? <laughs> and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people on the platform there. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Let's pray together and ask God's blessing upon His Word. Father, we thank You for having the Holy Spirit direct Nehemiah to record this, uh, this book. And we thank You for this pattern, this example we find here in chapter 8 of how You stir people by the preaching of the Word, and they must hear that Word. And Lord, help us today to understand what it means to hear the Word. And may the people sitting in this room realize their responsibility now is the ball is in their court as I begin this sermon. Help us, Father, to understand what it means to hear your Word preached. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So just very simply this morning, we're going to attempt to answer this question. What does hearing the Word of God involve? What is your job as you're sitting there for the next 25 to 30 minutes? What is your responsibility? How am I to be involved in hearing the Word of God? Well, first of all, I want you to notice this no-brainer point here, Captain Obvious. You must be in attendance for the preaching. You must be in attendance for the preaching. It's kind of hard to hear something if you're not there except for the video camera back there. 
You must be in attendance. Those verses 1 and 2 again. And some of the people. Only some of the people came to church that day. Is that what the Bible says? Really? And all the people? That's a new concept. <laughs> Didn't realize we all were supposed to come together, right? And all the people gathered themselves together, what? As one man. They were united. They came together, united for worship, to hear God's Word preached and taught. And they stood in the street that was before the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe, the preacher, bring the book of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Now notice here, everybody comes together. They all come together with the purpose of hearing the word of God preached and proclaimed. And notice there, as I said, they come together as one man. They're united. They come together with one purpose, and that was to hear God's word. In other words, they were united in their purpose of coming together to learn more about God and His word. They had a desire, as we talked about, or we will talk about tonight. They had this desire. That last week we talked about this hunger they had for God's Word. And we find they all come together here, united in the street now, standing on their feet for five to six hours to hear what the Word of God has to say. Now, don't, don't you think about this now. You can worship God, and you should worship God every day. You can read your Bible on your own every day, and you should. You can pray and do all those things. Don't you understand some of this morning? When you hear somebody make this statement, you immediately need to wave the red flag they don't know the Bible. If you hear anybody tell you this, I don't need to go to church to worship. Amen. No, technically you don't. But the Bible says we are to come together at some point as a body. Corporately, we're to come together at some point during the week and get together as a body, united as one, for the purpose of edifying each other, hearing the word of God, being preached, taught, and proclaimed. You see, Hebrews 10.25 exhorts us to do that. It says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Now, for many people, gathering together like we are right now is a burden. It interferes with their plans. Man, I, I was going to do X Sunday, but because we've got church, I can't do X. Listen, folks, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you find it a burden to come to church, you need to look at your heart. Amen. I mean, like saying I love my wife, but I don't want to go home to her. <laughs> Amen? Our anniversary's coming up. I'm going to move up, all right? <laughs> There's a lot of people who claim they love Jesus, but they don't want to be around his people. You see, we're to come together. Many people's got plans and projects to keep them from faithfully coming to worship and hear the word of God preached and proclaimed. You know, a lot of people are like uh, uh, this one preacher uh, he was referring to. Somebody said, how's the attendance at the church? He said, it's up and it's down. Some of them are up in the mountains and some of them are down at the beach. <laughs> A lot of truth to that, isn't it? People are, you know what? If everybody, if every member of Bethel Baptist Church showed up next Sunday, we would not, this bill would not finish the hope. If they all came together with a purpose, united, hungry to hear the word of God, our building wouldn't hold. You know, people are full of excuses for missing church. Uh, one pastor put in the bulletin, he said, cots will be available for those who say Sunday's their only day to sleep. Eye drops will be supplied for those who have red eyes from watching late night, Saturday night television. There'll be steel helmets for those who say the roof would cave in there with the church. There'll be blankets for those who are cold, bands for those that are hot. There'll be scorecards for those who wish to keep up with the hypocrites that are there. There'll be TV dinners there for those who say they don't have time to cook 
bunch. And finally, they'll be poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who've never seen a church without either one. <laughs> Aren't we full of excuses? Full of excuses on not attending church. But if you're going to hear the Word of God, number one, you must be in attendance for the preaching. Amen. Number two, if you're going to hear the Word of God, you must be attentive during the preaching. You must be attentive during the preaching. Now our text speaks of two ways in which these people gave evidence they were paying attention to the preaching of the Word. Notice, first of all, those who are attentive have respect for the Word. Those who are attentive have respect for the Word. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5 again. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning to the midday before the men, the women, and those that could understand in the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And as the scribes stood upon a pulpit of wood which they made for the purpose and beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Anaya and Urijah and Hilkiah and Maaseah and on his right hand and on his left hand Padiah and Mishamel and Malchiah and Hashem and Hasperdana and Zechariah and Melshem. And Ezra opened the book in sight of all the people for he was above all the people and when he opened it all the people stood up. You know, last week I mentioned Ezra was this long-winded preacher who read from the law from daylight till noon. But I want you to notice there, that wasn't a one-hour worship service. It wasn't a one-hour worship service. And the people didn't complain. They weren't jumping up in the middle of service and running here and running there, getting a drink of water, going there and checking their phone, and going here and doing this like popcorn like we have around here sometimes. It's like popcorn here. You can't be a chance being a popcorn. <coughs> These people are zeroed in. You get the picture? Ezra's on a platform like this, raised up for the purpose where they can hear him clearly, they can zero their eyes in, and they can give their full attention to the Word of God. Now, this service was totally different from the mindset of many churches today. Did you know that in fact one preacher in Florida designed a 22-minute worship service? He called it the Compact Mini 22 minute worship service. The pastor of First American Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida, and he had it at 8 o'clock. And in 1,320 seconds, he preached an 8 minute sermon. He led in two songs. He read a passage of scripture and had a prayer, and they were gone. <laughs> this is his reason. He said, This mini service is to reach people whose parents made them attend church growing up and they're burned out on church or maybe they need religion in small doses. Aren't too many of us. There's several people today with that mindset. Some of you right now are watching you watch. We've got this imaginary line at mid at noon that God will be done every Sunday. You know that? Think about this. You, when you want me to be done, you're not want me to be done. You actually want God to be done. But every Sunday, oh Lord, get done working. We'll shut the preacher up, get the music done. We got to get out of here and get to the restaurant. <laughs> you see, these folks were in a hurry. The length of the service didn't matter to Ezra's audience. They attended and they paid attention. Notice there, verse three says, "In the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law." And that literal, that phrase literally means their ears were glued to the Word of God. They were giving God's Word their total attention. They had respect for God's Word because they realized when the Word was being read, it had gravity, it had weight, it had authority. They perked up, they listened, they glued their ears to the Word of God because they had respect for the Word of God. Verse 4 tells us in Ezra, stood up on this pulpit, this raised area for the purpose of not exalting Ezra, but to lift up God's Word to a place of priority where the people could see and hear clearly and they give their undivided attention. Notice here also in verse 5 that when he read the Word of God, the people stood up. How would you like to stand the entire time during a worship service? Some of you moan when he asked you to stand twice during the singing. Oh. 
Some of you probably because you can't help it. <laughs> These folks stood for six, five to six hours with their ears glued, their eyes focused, listening attentively to the Word of God because they had respect for the Word of God. Amen. Had respect. It's like one writer said, if your boss comes in your office, he comes to you on the assembly line, he calls you in his office, you're going to give him your undivided attention and your respect because he's your employer. How much more should we give God our respect, our attention, as we hear from Him, from His Word, not from the preacher, but through His Word? So we find here, you've got to be in attendance for the preaching. And you, secondly, you've got to be attentive, and the first way you're attentive is those who are attentive have respect for the Word. They're listening closely. They're paying attention. They're not here, there, and everywhere. They're bought in. They're solely focused, undivided on the Word of God. Second, those who are attentive have reverence for the Lord. They have reverence for the Lord. Notice the last half of verse 6. And they bow their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, notice here, they have bowed their heads and their hearts and worship. You know something? You bow your head, but you don't bow your heart, you're not worshiping. Right. It's about the heart. We find them humbling themselves. They lay flat, prostrate on the ground, humbling themselves because they realize they are hearing from holy God. You see, the people's reverence for the Lord here is shown in their outward uh, a display of humbleness. They came into the presence of the Lord. They approached Him in the right manner. And the people came together, united for the right purpose of hearing the Word of God being preached and taught. You know, most of the time, when, when we hear the Word of God, what happens when we hear the Word of God? Most of you look every Sunday. <laughs> and in your mind, you're saying, I shall, I shall not be moved. <laughs> the Word of God don't face most people. But if you remember verse 9, I'm not going to go back and preach last week. Remember verse 9? They wept when they heard God's Word preached. They were, they were touched. They were humbled because God's Word revealed to them their sin. And what an example these Israelites serve us, uh, serve for us. We don't respond to the Word week after week, sermon after sermon, invitation after invitation. There's no brokenness. There's no humility. There's no budge. We're not affected by the Word of God. These people are broken. They realize this is God's Word speaking to us. It is spoke to us and we lay flat on our face before holy God because we have a reverence for the Lord. You see, these folks had revival. We get a little further on in the night, you really see they have revival. But we find here their hearts had been gripped. And we find that when you and I have a reverence and a respect for the Word of God and the Lord of that Word, we are prime candidates for God to stir us and revive us. But until we have a respect for God and respect for His Word, we can't expect God to move among us and stir us much at all. Notice here. What does hearing the word involve, preacher? First of all, you must be in attendance for the preaching. If you're going to hear it, you need to be here in person. That video camera don't do me any good. It makes me look 50 pounds heavier than I am, and I'm heavy enough. <laughs> and then I have to go back and watch it later, and I go, boy, I look at that. What a terrible sermon. And it's out there for eternity now. What is hearing the word involved? You must be in attendance for the preaching. You must be attending during the preaching. And third, you must be accepting of the preaching. You must be accepting of the preaching. Now the text reveals two ways that we know the people accepted the preaching of the word of God. How do we know that they accepted the message? <clears throat> Notice two ways. First of all, they expressed, or you need to express your acceptance vocally. Express your acceptance vocally. Notice the first half of verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Amen. 
You see, Ezra blessed the Lord. That word blessed is a word for worship or adoration. Ezra gets the ball rolling. He sets the example. He praises God first. And then the people, after hearing the word read, they respond vocally by saying, Amen, Amen. What's Amen, Amen mean? So be it. A modern term we'd say is sure. You're agreeing. You're agreeing with the Word of God. You're saying, yes, so be it. Yes, I agree. I accept what the Word is saying. You see, God is a great God. He's worthy of our praise and adoration and our worship. And we shouldn't have to beg or plead with Christians to want to worship Him or to vocally express their worship to God. You see, as a child of God, hear me this morning, it is a privilege for you and I to get to worship and we ought to vocally express our worship to Him and we ought to vocally express our acceptance of the Word of God. About four we've got my point there. Amen, amen is a vocal expression of the Word of God. If you're going to hear it and you're going to accept it, you're saying, I agree with it, sure, sure, so be it. Amen, amen is the way to vocally express that. You see, we find here that sometimes, I don't know about you, but I can't help shouting a little bit. I shared with somebody earlier, I've been accused of being a bad cause for many times. You know why? Because Jesus did a lot for me. I don't know about you, he done a lot for this old boy. I was hell bound and hell bent, and all I deserved was hell. But he saved me by his amazing grace. He pulled me out of the miry clay. He put me on the rock. He established my steps. He called me to serve him. Listen, I got a lot to praise God for, and you do too, friend. If you just be honest, we all vocally express our praise and worship to God for all he's done for us. You see, Jesus has Jesus loves me. He suffered for me. He died for me. And he saved me. And I've got a lot to thank you for this morning. Amen. We're going to vocally express our praise and worship. You know, worship is something you and I are going to do for eternity. You know what this is right here? This is a practice session. We get to practice worshiping Almighty God here and now because we're going to do so for eternity. Right. Look at this every Sunday. Hey, I'm going to practice. Not to put on a show. Not to be phony or insincere, but to practice. Hey, I'm getting warmed up for what's going to take place for all eternity. As one writer said, we're here to praise the Lord. Sometimes when you hear something that's right, you ought to express your agreement. Amen. When the preacher is lifting up Jesus and he's preaching the truth, you ought to say amen. Amen. And we need to break out of this rut we're in where we're afraid to vocally express our acceptance of God's Word. You're going to hear the Word of God. First of all, you're going to be in attendance for the preaching. Second, you must be a tender in the preaching. Third, you must be accepting of preaching. You're going to express your acceptance vocally. And finally, you're going to express your acceptance visually. Now the Baptists are about to swarm. Look at verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. Well, Baptists, Baptists, both of you got your hand on your wallet. <laughs> you're afraid the Lord's going to let you give a big gift and you, you know you can't get that hand up there you're worried about something <laughs> well I think I, 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 I got the spirit well I hope you got the spirit amen you all visually give evidence that you accept the word of God not only did they say amen amen they had their hands lifted in praise to holy God amen. you see we're going to lift our hands and bow our hearts before the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, have you ever noticed how natural it is for a child, especially a small child, to crawl up to mama or daddy? I think about Hudson. I was thinking about this illustration. I was thinking about Hudson. They come up to your feet and they go up to your britches leg and they look at you. Why is it natural for a child to stick their hands up to their father? Isn't that natural? It would be natural for a child of God to stick their hands up to their father. Amen. 
We're to lift our hands in praise because we know He loves us just as a child knows their father loves them. Just as they know a child that knows their father will take them and love them and embrace them and caress them. We ought to lift our hands to Holy God because we know He will do that and so much more for us. We lift our hands in praise. Visually express our acceptance of God's Word. You see, the Bible says that the people were not only vocally expressing, but they were visually excited there. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 8. 1 Timothy 2 8 says, I desire therefore that the men were everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubt. You see, the Word of God teaches us it is a proper thing to do to raise our hands in worship to the Lord. Psalm 63, 3-4 says, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. You see, there should be visible excitement in the house of God. You know, think about this. We get excited about sports. Have you ever noticed something? People will go to the sports game. And hoop and holler like an Indian. <laughs> but they come to church and act like a totem pole. <laughs> Some of you get that later. <laughs> Some of you have to even Google totem pole. <laughs> <laughs> we get excited about sports. We get excited about hobbies. Woo! Talk about deer seeds. Mm, you get me talking real quick. <laughs> We get excited about family gatherings. We get excited about a wedding, the birth of a child. We get excited about a job promotion. But we tend to shy from getting excited about Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? That's odd. That's backwards. That's unusual. You see, if there's anything you and I ought to be excited about, it ought to be Jesus. Amen. Or express our acceptance visually of the Word of God. Now tonight we'll see more evidence of this revival. And I'll tease you just a little. These folks don't get enough of this six-hour sermon. They come back for more the next day. And the next day. And the next day. And the next day. Seven consecutive days. They listen to five and six hours of preaching. Because they have been stirred by the Word of God, the Spirit of God. We'll see more about that tonight. The first ingredient is the preaching of the Word. The second there is the hearing of the Word. I want you to think about something today. I want you to realize you have a part in my preaching, a small part of my preaching every week. Two things you need to do for me to help me to preach. Number one is pray for me. Amen. Pray for me. I'm not going to get off on a simple trip, but you have no idea what I did with the course of a week. So I tried to study. Phone rings, knock at the door, email, text message, Facebook, something's wrong, I need this, I need that. And I just got my mind zeroed in. Here I go again. I do what I do and I come back. Where was I? What was that? Pray for me. Number two, give me time to study and pray. Give me time. Listen, I love you. I do. I'm not concerned about you, but I can't run to everything that happens. Because if I do, this will be But late Saturday night and early Sunday morning. Trying to finish it up. I'm not going to get off together, Lord. I've been faithful all week. Running here and there. Seeing after this, that, and the other. And I've got the idea sort of here. I, I think I kind of know, Lord. Now i got to try to cram it in. You know what happens when I do that? I cheat you. 
because you don't get the full load. Pray for me and give me time to study and pray. Amen. But that's as far as your responsibility goes in the preaching. The rest is up to me. It's on me to deliver the Word faithfully. But here, let's flip that now. All I can do is pray for you to hear the Word, but the rest is up to you today. You've got to hear the Word. You see, I can't control whether you really want to hear it. I can't control whether you're interested in it. All I can do is present it, and then you've got to hear it. So let me close this morning by asking you this. How well do you hear the Word of God? How well do you hear the Word of God? Do you make it a priority to attend the corporate gathering of the body of Christ to hear the Word of God taught and preached? Simply put, are you regularly attending the worship services? Can't hear the Word. You can hear it through Facebook there. But you realize I found out there's something about intimacy here. See, some of you don't realize what happened today. Just by you coming through the door and taking a seat, you encourage somebody else around you. Right. Amen. I look at some of our experienced life members. Isn't that a PC word for Senior Doug, isn't it? <laughs> experienced life members struggle to come up those ramp out there. Hurting, aching, would have probably been better off to stay at home. But they come here because they love God and His Word and His people. That encourages me. Don't encourage you. I look at these young parents. They come in and they look like they've just been through the battle royal. Man, they've got kids with toes hanging out and hairs everywhere. They've been fighting kids for an hour and a half to get here. That encourages me. It encourages other young parents. Because you're not the only one. Listen, the preacher's house is rough too, isn't it? <laughs> when I pastored for Chapel Greenfield, on the way out there, there was a country road, the Forks, Shades Bridge Road goes to the right, and Meridian goes to the left. And we used to joke one Sunday, Susie and I had a rough morning. I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to get some boxing gloves, and we're going to put them in the trunk, and we're going to stop out here at the Y, and we're going to duke it out, and then we're going to go to church. <laughs> Have you ever noticed the devil's more on you on Sunday morning than in the morning of the week? Amen. Same way at the preacher's house. It's no different. You may struggle to get here whether you've got kids or whether you don't. Come on. Come on anyways. When you do attend the preaching of God's Word, I ask you, are you attentive? Where's your mind and your eyes and your ears when God's Word is being preached and taught? Do you give it your complete attention? Are you ever broken or humbled by the Word of God. And does that brokenness and that humility cause you to bow low before God? Does it cause you to find yourself humble before Him? Are you accepting of God's Word when it's preached? When was the last time you responded to God's Word? When was the last time God spoke to you and you obeyed immediately? Have you been going through the motions? We'll see tonight these folks have been going through the motion for nearly a thousand years and they weren't really worshiping. They were just going through the motions. We'll get to that tonight. Maybe you're going through the motions. You come here on Sunday, you check the box, I've done my thing, I'm out of here. Or you're genuinely here to worship and hear the Word of God. Maybe you're here this morning you're lost. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You say, well, what does hearing the Word have to do for me? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing. Amen. Hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning. And you're lost. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Perhaps something, the Spirit used something said or done here today to stir your heart. Or maybe somebody's already shared the gospel with you previously and the Lord has dealt with your heart about being saved. Would you come today and put your faith in Christ? I'm going to be down front here. I'll be glad to talk with you about that. But the walk of Miss Kathy is going to come and we're going to have a song of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning and you've got some decisions to make. I encourage you to make those decisions as well. Maybe you're going to make the decision. Do you know what? When I come to God's house, I'm going to be attentive to His Word. I'm going to hear it. 
I'm going to be attentive, but in attendance, I'm going to be attentive and I'm going to be accepting. And then obey God's word. Amen. As we stand and say, what about Brother Walter? 181 Blue Book. 181 Blue Book. 